What's going on, y'all? How we doing? Good. <laughs> yeah, hot. It is hot out there. Amen. Uh, hey, it's good to see you guys. Like the video announcement said, I'm Josh. If I haven't met you, I'd uh, love to meet you at the end of service right down here. That'd be awesome. We're going to call people up for prayer uh, at the end, and we would love to chat with you, and I'd love to meet you. Um, we have been in a series called From the Heart, and you have heard from uh, a variety of different staff members on what God has been teaching them, and I am pleased to be able to close out this sermon series this week. Chris will be back with us next week, but uh, for the meantime, we are going to be in Acts chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, you can turn uh, to Acts chapter 3. Uh, and I'm just going to come right out and tell you what my sermon's about. Uh, no funny story, nothing fancy at the beginning. I'm just going to come straight out and say that the point of my sermon is that the kingdom is here and the kingdom is coming. That the reality we live in as disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, is that the kingdom of God is here, but it's also not yet here. It's a tension that we live in. There's a reality that it's already, but not yet. What we see in Jesus's teachings is that the kingdom's here, like breakthrough is here, heaven invades earth so often that happens and it's real, it's right in front of us. While at the same time, it's not yet here. We don't always see heaven invade earth in the way that we would like to, in the way that we may see it should in scripture. There's a tension that we have to live in as followers of Jesus. But I believe that in that tension, we find ourselves possessing an authority from the Holy Spirit to declare and demonstrate the gospel and the kingdom of God wherever we go. That's a law I just threw at you. We're going to walk through it and I'm going to talk about it. But that's what it is. The kingdom is here and the kingdom is coming. And as a follower of Jesus, we live in the tension. And in that tension, there's authority to call heaven down to earth and to suffer well. Okay, Acts chapter three, here we go. Verse one. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Let me give you a little bit of context. Acts chapter one, Jesus promises his disciples that he will send them, them his spirit and that spirit will fill them with power to go and be witnesses in all the earth. Acts chapter two, Jesus fulfills that promise. He sends his spirit on the day of Pentecost. I preached on that a couple weeks ago. Uh, he sends his spirit on the day of Pentecost. They're filled with the spirit. They're filled with power and they immediately begin witnessing. At the end of chapter two, we see the disciples are gathering. They're devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings. They're sharing meals together. Nobody had any lack. They just gave away everything that they had. And they continued to go up to the temple together to pray. And in Acts chapter three, we see Peter and John going up to the temple to pray. And what we know about this man that they see, so they're walking into the temple. They see this man. And what we know about him is he's been lame from birth never been able to walk. Ever since he was born, he has not been able to walk. He has been lame from birth. And every day people would carry him and put him at the temple gate so he could ask people for money. This is how he made a living. Now, on top of that, he wasn't allowed to enter the temple. He was not allowed to go in because he was lame and he was declared unclean. So he wasn't even able to go in. He just could stand right there, sit right there at the gate of the temple and just ask for money when everybody just would walk right by him. And we can actually assume that Peter and John had seen this guy before. That even as they were following Jesus around some 60 days ago, they had, a, as a group, probably walked by this guy a time or two. But this time, Peter and John take notice. They see him. They don't just walk by him, they actually see him. So what did they do? Let's keep reading. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Let's break it down. They're walking by. They see this man asking for money and they say, hey, look at us. And the man looks at them and he's expecting money from them. But thanks to Jesus, Peter and John are broke. 
Jesus had called them out of their regular paychecks and said, hey, follow me. Don't worry about those things. Follow me. So they had nothing to give him. No money, thanks to Jesus. But so Peter looks at him and says, hey, I, I, don't, I don't have money. But what I do have, I give you. And now this is where the story goes crazy. It gets whack. He commands this man to get up and walk. He doesn't pray for him. He doesn't stop down and start praying, dear Lord, I pray that you would. He commands it. Rise up and walk. And not only does he command it, he reaches down like it's a done deal. He reaches down and grabs him and pulls him up. This is a whole new level of confidence. I I don't know what Peter's thinking here. Keep... Okay, keep this in mind. He's lame from birth, okay? So when Peter is commanding him to get up, he's not just commanding the paralysis to leave. If he's never walked before, he doesn't have muscle in his legs. He can't walk. He's muscle atrophied. And if you've ever known a toddler, it takes them months to learn how to walk. And this man has never walked before. So with one command, Peter's commanding paralysis to go, muscle to grow, and for the ability to walk. One command, rise up and walk. And he reaches down and grabs him. Like, could you imagine if it didn't happen? Seriously. Hey, come on, I rise up and walk. And he's like, dude, I can't, I'm lame. And he falls over and how rude and unsympathetic and insensitive is that of Peter if he is not healed? Three miracles and Peter just commands it on the spot. How does he have that much confidence? Because if, if it's me, I'm walking straight by the guy at my worst. At my best, I might give him a couple bucks and say, God bless. Not many of us, maybe none of us would have the confidence to just tell this man to get up and walk. Now, my point of this is not that anybody that we see that has some sort of disability, we should just go and tell them to get up and walk. That's insensitive. There is a pastoral piece to this. I don't think this passage is prescriptive. It's not telling us that everybody that we see who's sick, we just say, be healed. But Peter's operating in in a way that's foreign to us. He knows something. It's like Peter knows something that I'm like, wait, wait, what do you, what do you know? (laughs) So what is it? It's authority. Peter's walking in authority. I wanna break that down. I wanna talk about authority. Like, what is it? Where does it come from? What does it look like? And in order to do that, we have to look at the life and ministry of Jesus, okay? So at this point in the sermon, I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Some of it will be up there, some of it will not, but stay with me. It's gonna be worth it, I hope. I want us to think about the life of Jesus in the context of two words, declaration and demonstration. He declared and he demonstrated. Okay? He declared the kingdom of God and he demonstrated the kingdom of God. When Jesus walked onto the public scene, his one primary message was the kingdom of God is here or kingdom of heaven. They're synonymous. The kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. That was his message. That was his mission. Everything Jesus did was unto ushering in this kingdom. Even dying on a cross was to give all people a chance to enter this kingdom and find the healing and restoration in it. This is what Jesus did. This is why he lived. So he came on the public scene, uh, public scene and he declared the kingdom with his mouth. Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We walked through it together not long ago. Jesus is teaching about life and he's speaking with such authority that at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, the crowds are in awe because he's teaching as one with authority, not as the scribes. Jesus had such authority when he taught and declared things of the kingdom that people couldn't help but listen. When someone is an authority on, uh, on a topic, we listen to them. If we're watching the weather, we see this guy who's a meteorologist and we think, oh, he probably knows what he's talking about. I should probably listen. And if you're in Texas, you realize there's no meteorologist who knows what they're talking about here. But generally, hopefully, a weatherman, weather woman has authority on the topic, right? And we listen. We take cues from people who have authority in something. And Jesus had authority in life that you just, he just talked about life and you listened. You couldn't help it. So much so that at the end of this Sermon on the Mount, they're just in awe. They can't even believe it. They've never heard teaching like this. 
He did not just declare it with his mouth. He demonstrated it with his deeds, with his actions. Right after the Sermon on the Mount, there's a leper that comes up to Jesus and he heals the man. He says, if you're able, you can heal me. He says, I will be clean. Boom, healed, just like that, to show that Jesus has authority over sickness and disease. And he goes on and he heals many others right, at, right after Matthew 7. In Matthew 8, it's a leper. There's many others that are coming to him and everyone's being healed to show that Jesus doesn't just talk about it. He is about it. He has the authority over sickness and disease. And then right after that, he goes on the boat with the disciples and there's the storm and he tells the waves and the winds to be still to show that Jesus has authority over creation itself. Right after that, it's the, the demoniac that comes to Jesus and he says, uh, he tells the demon to leave to show that Jesus has authority over even the forces of evil and Satan. So right after this sermon where he's declaring the kingdom of God, he demonstrates three times in a row I have authority over sickness and disease, over creation itself, and over the forces of evil. He declared the kingdom was here with his mouth, and he demonstrated it with his deeds. That is authority. Jesus has this authority. So the question we need to ask, where does he get it from? Where does that authority come from? He declared with authority. He demonstrated with authority. The kingdom was present when Jesus was there. So where did that authority come from? A lot of people will think that the authority of Jesus came because he was God. He was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. So when he was walking around the earth and telling people what to do and telling sicknesses to leave and demons to go, it was because he was God. I don't actually think that's what we see in scripture. Acts chapter 10, 37 to 38. I believe we have this up here. Peter is preaching to the Gentiles and he says, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. According to this passage, where did Jesus get his authority from? The Holy Spirit in him given to him by God on high. He anoints Jesus, he fills Jesus with the Holy Spirit and it is from that filling and anointing comes the authority. It's not because he's God, it's because God is with him. He goes around and does all of these things because the Holy Spirit is living in him. It says Jesus of Nazareth. The emphasis here is that Jesus was a human filled with the Holy Spirit doing all of these things. Okay, he had his authority because he was filled with the Spirit. Let's jump to Matthew chapter 10. This is nuts. This is crazy. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The authority that Jesus had from God, from the Holy Spirit, he actually gave it to his disciples. If he had the authority because he was God, he would not have been able to give it to them. He can't make them God, but because he was filled with the spirit, he gave the spirit to his disciples, granting them the authority to go cast out demons and heal every sickness and disease. And they do it. If you read the story, they go about and they just do the things Jesus was doing. They cast out demons and they heal diseases so much so that they come back to Jesus and like, dude, the demons listen to us. I can just imagine Jesus in that moment. Like, of course they do. You have the authority from the spirit and they're rejoicing together that all that God had done through the apostles and through the authority that they had. So you might be thinking, okay, well, okay. That's Jesus and the apostles, aren't they different? It's not us. Glad you asked. Acts chapter two, preached on this a few weeks ago. Let me remind you, God sends his Holy Spirit to fill all those who follow Jesus. That the spirit descends on all that call on the name of Jesus. There's no limit to where the spirit goes. Here's my point. Every follower of Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit and therefore has authority over disease, sickness, and the forces of evil. That's you. You follow Jesus, you trust in Jesus. You have the authority Jesus had when he walked the earth. 
Peter knew it, John knew it, the disciples knew it, and everyone sitting in this room, if you follow Jesus, have the authority to call heaven down to earth. Maybe I'm the only one that gets excited about that. This changes everything. This changes everything. It changes how we see the world around us. And Peter knew that. He exercised this authority with a declaration and a demonstration. In the story, he walks by this guy and demonstrates that the kingdom is here, that there's no disease, there's no paralysis, and there's no sickness in heaven. And he calls it down to earth with the authority that he has. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. He demonstrates it. Then what happens at the end of Acts 3 is everybody starts looking at Peter and John like, dude, the gods have visited us. And they begin to kind of gawk at their power and worship them. And, and Peter's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are you doing this to me? I didn't heal this guy. It was in the name of Jesus and faith in his name that this man is standing before you well. What's happening? Peter demonstrated the kingdom of God. Now he's declaring it with his mouth. That is the rhythm of the book of Acts. There's a demonstration followed by a declaration. There's some sort of experience where the kingdom of God comes and meets people. There's breakthrough, there's healing, there's salvation. There's these crazy things that are happening immediately followed by, hey, here's what's happening right there. There's a declaration. A lot of the times I want it the other way around, right? And, and sometimes that happens, but I want to kind of know what's coming before it comes. Could you give me a little explanation before you do something? I kind of want to know what to expect and then you can do it. Honestly, that's not how Jesus really operated. That's not how the Holy Spirit operates. He often just gives us experiences and then later backs it up with explanation. And this is what Peter is doing. This rhythm of demonstration and declaration you are being invited into. This changes everything. So how do we do it? How do we declare and how do we demonstrate? First, Declaring and demonstrating the kingdom of God means believing that the kingdom is here. It really is here. That's why Peter could say, rise up and walk and reach down and grab the guy. He believed that the kingdom was actually here. There was a level of expectation that Peter had that, man, I, I long for. He put himself in a scenario that if God did not show up, it was going to go really, really bad. He did that all over. All the apostles and disciples in the book of Acts put themselves in situations where if God did not show up, it was not going to end well. And God showed up every time. Let me just bring it down on our, on our level so that we can kind of see, okay, how does this actually, what does it mean kingdom is here in my life? How many times a week does somebody you know you're talking to um, talk to you about a pain that they might have in their body? Uh, it's multiple times a week for me. And it's just like the natural way that we um, live. Like we just wake up in the morning sometimes and we're in pain and we don't know why. But multiple times a week, hey, how are you? Man, I'm all right, my back hurts. Or man, I rolled my ankle playing basketball or you name it. Multiple times in a week, this happens to me. And it's probably gonna happen to you if it hasn't this week already. And what do we do in that moment? Most of the time I'm like, oh man, I'm sorry. But now I'm like, no, wait, the kingdom's here. And there's no pain in heaven. So, hey, can we pray for that? God actually might want to heal you right now. I want that mindset. I want that level of expectation. And so I'm going to tell you a story. Um, I in no way share this because I am trying to um, boost myself or boast. It, it was the first thing that came to mind. I think it illustrates maybe a little bit of what I'm talking about. Uh, and in, I did it in an imperfect way, but let me just, I'm just going to tell you a story. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the Farmer's Branch campus and I was walking uh, to the stairs and I saw Andrea Bordelon. She's our kids ministry coordinator here at this campus. Uh, and I walked up to her and um, I was like, hey, Andrea, how are you? And as she's answering, I noticed she has a boot on her left foot and she was limping. And as she's answering, I'm like, hey, what happened to your foot? And she said, oh, last night I kind of stepped off uh, my porch wrong and, and hit my toe and aggravated a stress fracture. 
And I was like, oh man, I'm sorry. And then immediately I had this decision to make. Am I gonna say, oh, I'm sorry and go about my day? Or am I gonna stop in that moment and expect God to show up, call heaven down to earth with the authority I have from the Holy Spirit and see what might happen? I'll be honest, I wanted to do the first one. But I felt compelled by the Spirit. There were situations in that day that I felt was leading to this moment. I was like, Andrea, can I pray for you that you'd be healed right now? Quick tip, always ask, especially if you're gonna pray for healing in the moment. That might catch people off guard if all of a sudden you're saying, be healed, that, just ask. And so I asked, I said, hey, can I pray for healing right now that you'd be healed in this moment? And she was like, yeah, yeah. So we sat down and I told her to prop her leg up on the chair and she has her boot on and I put my hand on her boot. And I also said, hey, can I put my hand on your foot? That's a, another quick tip. If you're gonna lay hands, ask, okay? And, and so I put my hand on her foot, really on her boot. Uh, and I began to pray and I asked, uh, well, I thanked God for his presence. I said, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening, that you hear this, that you love us and you're present. And then I started talking to her foot. Yeah, it's weird. I said, I command the pain in your foot to leave. In the name of Jesus, I pray and command that what's broken would be restored and what's crooked would be made straight in the name of Jesus, amen. Andrea, how you feeling? Still hurts. It's like, what are you kidding me? But something in the back of my mind was like, hey, pray again. I was like, all right, Andrew, can I pray again that you might be healed right now? She's like, okay. <laughs> and so I did the same, more or less the same exact thing. I put my hand on her boot and I began to pray pretty much the same thing, sprinkled in a little prayer for peace there. Uh, and then I said, amen. And I asked how she was feeling and she said her foot was really warm like really, really warm. And it felt like somebody was massaging the bottom of her foot. It was not me. My hand was on the top, on the boot. It was not massaging her foot, but she felt this massage happening on the bottom of her foot and this warmth. And I was like, okay, well, you need to stand up right now and see if there's pain. And she stood up and the pain was completely gone. It was gone. Like earlier that morning, she had to go to her neighbor to get a boot because she couldn't walk. And then in this moment, she's like, I guess I don't need this anymore. And she takes off her boot, goes down to her car, gets her other shoe, puts it on, is walking around like normal. I was shocked. I was like, okay, why didn't it happen the first time? That's what I want to know. But also praise God. And Andrea came back up to get, after getting her shoe. And I was like, Andrea, you need to know. I did not just heal you. That was not me. That was not my prayer. It wasn't a magical thing that just happened. That was God in heaven healing you to show you that he's real, he's good, he loves you, and he's intimately involved in everything in your life. And she was just like, amen. There was a demonstration of the kingdom of God here on earth, followed by a declaration that it is here and it is moving and it's active. So when you come across someone this week who's in pain or is hurting, sensitively ask, well, can I pray that you would be healed? You can even blame me. It's like, ah, oh, the guy was preaching this last week in a church told me to do this. That's fine, but take a risk. Sometimes the only thing holding heaven back from really breaking through is someone's willingness to take a risk. So just try it and see what happens. Just see what happens, take a risk. Secondly, declaring and demonstrating the kingdom of God means believing that the kingdom is coming. Sometimes I pray and, uh, for healing and it doesn't happen. I have a friend right now whose dad is in the hospital dying. Got bad news last night. Been praying for him. I'm sure people have gone into the hospital room to pray for him. Not healed. The kingdom's here, but in this confusing, weird, only Jesus kind of way, it's also still coming. Because in the middle of declaring and demonstrating that the kingdom of God is here on earth right now, Jesus also promises to his disciples that they're gonna suffer. His whole ministry is declaring this message that the kingdom of heaven is here now. And also take heart because you're gonna find trouble. Suffering is coming your way. But here's the truth that some of the most powerful displays of the kingdom of heaven happen when God's people remain steadfast and hopeful in the middle of darkness and despair. 
Some of the most powerful displays of the kingdom of heaven being here right now happens when God's people, you and me, remain steadfast and full of hope in the middle of darkness, despair, and disappointment. So what do we do when trouble comes? What do we do when suffering comes? And when the kingdom, <clears throat> excuse me, seems far off. The kingdom's here, but when it seems far off, what do we do? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Ryan already mentioned it. I don't know if you knew I had it in here. He did. didn't? Cool. Go Jesus. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So many people ask, what is the will of God for my life? And that question is more intense and desperate, especially when we're going through suffering. Like, God, why are you doing this? What is your will for me in this situation that does not seem like it's gonna change? This darkness, this despair, it's, it's taking over me. God, what is your will for me in this season? And Paul gives you three commands, rejoice, pray, and give thanks. When we rejoice, when times are hard, we're exercising authority in that moment, telling ourselves and those around us and Satan himself that what's happening to me does not have the final say. I mean, just have this picture of God's people rejoicing in the midst of suffering. Like, what is that telling Satan? who's throwing everything at you, everything he's got, he's throwing it at you. And you're just over here rejoicing God, praising, praying, giving thanks. What is that communicating to Satan that he has nothing on you? He can throw things at you. He can take things away from you. But in the middle of that, we can rejoice, have joy. We can pray, we can give thanks. And you might be saying, this is insane, Josh. How can I rejoice when I'm in the middle of darkness? How can I rejoice when the kingdom seems very far away? How can God's kingdom be here and break through, but at the same time, totally seem thousands of miles away? If you're asking that question, I would point you to the reality of the cross of Jesus. That at the end of the gospels, we see the son of God, the one who ushered in this kingdom full of power and authority, breakthrough and restoration, give up all authority and die on a cross. It looked like the kingdom of heaven must not really be here. I just imagine that Good Friday. Why do we call it Good Friday? I don't know, because it's dark. Jesus is dead. He's hanging on the cross, breathless. And it seems like Satan wins in that moment. But that moment was brief because three days later, Jesus arose. He rose from the grave victorious. Death itself could not hold Jesus. And when it seemed like Satan had won and the kingdom of heaven was far off, God was at work for the good of his people and for his own glory. And one day Jesus is going to come back and usher in the rest of the kingdom. In Revelation 21, it says that the dwelling place of God is with man and he himself will be their God in their presence and he will wipe every tear from your eyes. Mourning will be no more and death itself will be gone. That's what's coming. That's why in the middle of our darkness and despair right now, we can rejoice. Because this does not have authority over me. Jesus, who gave up all authority, now is risen, ascended, seated at the right hand of God, will one day come back and make all things new. That is enough to rejoice and to give thanks and to pray about in the middle of our darkness and despair. Some of the most powerful displays of the kingdom of God come when God's people rejoice in the middle of darkness. So sometimes we see the kingdom of God on display when heaven breaks through. And, 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 and when we're done, um, after the band, uh, after communion, after the band sings one more song, uh, I want to do a special invitation tonight that I want to ask uh, God to do a miracle, some miracles, multiple tonight, that um, if you feel comfortable and you are in here and you have pain in your body or you are sick in some way, uh, we want to pray for you at the end of service. Not because I think that I'm special, Ryan's special, no one's special, but because we want to expect God to break through tonight. He wants to bring healing. He wants to bring restoration. I believe that. I want to expect that. 
And so at the end, I want to invite you up to do that. So we see breakthrough, and sometimes we see the kingdom of God on display when God's people rejoice, pray, and give thanks when they're going through tough times. Both of those communicate to the world around us that my hope is not here, but it's in him. And so as we take what we have for communion, we're reminded of that moment Jesus hung on the cross, that his body was broken for you, and that his blood was spilled for you because he loves you. And so that you might know that no matter what comes your way, breakthrough or suffering, it all points to the reality that the kingdom is here and the kingdom is also coming. And we can praise him for that. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you that the grave could not hold your son. That Satan's most, most powerful weapon, death, does not have authority over us. It may seem like it does for a time, but we know one day death will be no more, Jesus. So we worship you, we praise you. <clears throat> and God, we ask that you would move right now to bring healing and restoration. That you bought that on the cross when you died, you bought for us the opportunity to find healing and restoration, not just spiritually in our souls, but physically in our bodies. And so bring healing tonight, Jesus. We love you because you first loved us in your name, amen.